Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host, Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechphilly.com. And as you can see here, columnist for the Jewish press. I'm having a lot of fun doing all of this. And I got to tell you, you know, I talk about how government relates to the Jewish community or doesn't, as the case may be. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, my roots have been in broadcast journalism. And there's actually an assemblyman who's with us today whose roots are also in broadcast journalism, a man after my own heart. This is uh, Assemblyman Michael Blake from the Bronx. Good to so be here. welcome to the Jewish View. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Maybe Thank you, Rabbi. Mark wants to run for the assembly. Yeah, you know I'm saying. You know, Maybe well, that's well, leading well, are, we gonna, are we going to be changing careers right yeah, now? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I feel a little bit of pressure right there. But know? he does have a great oh. voice. I oh, mean, this deep baritone. You know, there are some benefits to that right there. How is the Bronx doing? You know, when you know, I just say I'm 29 years old, of course. There we go. Exactly. It used to be the Bronx, or the, oh, it's a place where it's mm-hmm. depressed, and now it's like it's built up. No, we, we have uh, an incredible energy in the Bronx. Uh, obviously, as you know, we, we have a, a significant Jewish community up in Riverdale, in the northern part of the Bronx. But you, you look at the work that's been happening because of Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr., Speaker Carl Hasty from the Bronx, our new chair, Marcos Crespo. Uh, incredible opportunities. Who's an assemblyman? All in the, the last two in the assembly. You know, our assembly district, we're in the South Bronx. We have about 139,000 residents in the South Bronx in our district. And we have seen incredible progression. Uh, We have 91 schools, and we were able to get 10,000 free books to them because of the work with Tata Sons, Tata Consultant Services. Uh, Just the the My Brother's Keeper initiative recently, $20 million to help boys and young men of color. Uh, We're seeing incredible progress. Uh, And people, I'm always saying often, you know, yes, we're the home of hip hop and doo wop and salsa and the Yankees. Uh, We're also the home of incredible entrepreneurs. Uh, We're the home of incredible diversity. Many people may not realize the Bronx is the most diverse county in the country. It's also the most democratic county in the country. <laughs> uh, and so we have a lot of responsibilities, but we're, you know, that's why our, our new hashtag is building a better Bronx, and that's what we're doing right now. Now, let me uh, Ted Cruz came to the Bronx, and he got booed. Mm-hmm. But do you know why he went to the Bronx? Well, he got more than booed. I mean, the, the young people told him not to come as but, well. <laughs> but do you know why he came to the Bronx? Well, I mean, look, there, 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 is, uh, there are some individuals that uh, have a more conservative uh, no, nature no, no. about them. No, aside from Ruben Diaz Sr., mm-hmm. <laughs> who's from the Bronx, and he's got a very conservative uh, view. But do you know why he actually came? If you're asking what was his intent in coming, if, that, if that's your question. Okay. No, look, I, I think. No, no, do you, yeah, because it has to do with the delegates. Well, do you know about this, well, there's, there's, this formula? About so the, the formula delegate? of delegates is not just Bronx specific. So, no, I, so I just want to, no, you know, that's no, why I want to space that out, right? So, no, it, but it's the when you say it's the most Democratic county, yes. it's because he has fewest Republicans in each of the congressional districts. Yes, but so if he gets, if he wins any of the congressional districts that take in the Bronx, he gets the three delegates. If he wins by more than fifty percent, so again, so so let me try so, it a different yeah. way. The the, okay. the likelihood. <laughs> of someone like a Ted Cruz uh, doing well there uh, is incredibly minimal when you look at someone like Donald Trump, who most polls have him up 30 to 40 points in the Republican primary. So if you're in the most diverse county, you more than likely you any uh, Republicans that you do have there, which is a very limited number, are probably going to be a little bit more moderate and more understanding and have a greater connection to, to Trump than anyone else. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I think, I think well, Cruz- Well, I give him credit for trying. So, you know, hey, you know, he, he, he's yeah. being very uh, thoughtful yeah. uh, in his strategies. You know, obviously I, I reject uh, pretty much <laughs> everything that he is saying as yeah. well as on the other side. Uh, but, you know, what, what we're seeing right now is a, a, an attention in the presidential primary in New York that we haven't had in decades. Uh, and equally, you know, on, you know, on the 19th, you, you're, you're witnessing uh, state senate special election in Long Island, mm-hmm. uh, assembly special election down in the city. Uh, there's an attention that's happening uh, right now that you know, many of us may not be used to, but we're excited about. Well, I keep, you know, it's interesting because what you're, I don't really bring up presidential elections or national issues on this show, mm-hmm. but you have a background that takes you to President Obama. Mm-hmm. Could you please tell me about that and, well, you know, look, and, and what that is all about? In, in 2005, uh, when I was a, a, a producer in Chicago for a TV station, Comcast Sportsnet, uh, I, I started to feel that I needed to be able to help more people uh, in a very practical manner. Uh, and when you think about you know, my, my personal background, my family's from Jamaica, I was born in the Bronx, 
uh, born with a heart murmur. My, you know, I went to elementary school that was uh, uh, in Savage and Equality Children American Schools. You know, it was a, it was a tough upbringing. So for me, uh, public service is a way to give back, and politics is a way to give back. So uh, in 2006, I, I joined uh, Senator Obama at the time, the Yes We Can training program, learned how to run campaigns. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to be able to grow and expand, uh, go to Michigan, go run three state house races. And then in 2007, I went to Iowa. Uh, I was in Iowa March 3rd, 2007, uh, first day March 4th, 2007, for the, the caucuses. Uh, we won, fortunately. Ten more months, seven more states. Uh, you know, ending the first campaign, then going to D.C. for the inauguration. <laughs> uh, had a chance to work at the White House for two and a half years. Uh, directed uh, yeah. uh, state and local outreach, minority business outreach, African American outreach. And the uh, which department? Uh, an Office of Intergovernmental Affairs and Office of Public Engagement um, okay. at the White House. Uh, we created the Urban Entrepreneurship su Summit Series, went to seven different cities around the country, uh, had public, private, not for partner, uh, partner partnerships that we did there, uh, and then uh, went back onto the reelection as the National Deputy Director for Operation Vote. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah, um, yeah, you know, and then it was, um, it, was, uh, it was time to come home then. Mm -hmm. So uh, about seven years spent. Um, in, in the Obama family and Obama network, uh, which I think we did, uh, you know, transformational things. You know, he you seems were. like you'd want to have a pizza or a beer with him. It seems like you'd want to be, like he's so approachable. I, I have uh, uh, often felt um, that uh, people realize the, the greatness of, an, of his intelligence, uh, but they may not also realize just how great a person that he is. Yeah. And in uh, 2008 when we were campaigning uh, and we were really trying to mobilize some, some more conservative Democrats in Michigan specifically uh, you know where Reagan Democrats that term kind of emerges mm -hmm. you know Vice President Biden then Senator Obama Senator Biden said to a group you know I understand some people may be hesitant about him they may not know him well well I watched him um, with his daughters and my granddaughters have a pizza party during the convention uh, and that showed me the content of him as a person now, now go, uh, go back a minute did you say your Grand? No, not mine. Biden. No, Biden. Biden's granddaughter. Yeah, not okay. mine. I mean, I have a few gray hairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, wait a minute. You're, uh, you're too young yeah, for this. No, don't so, tell me that. So okay. it, it was a, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it was a, an, another reminder. Okay. Yeah. Of, of the content of him as a person. Uh, but again, it, it was time to come home. It, it was time to do, to do come home. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah.
so that tech companies that were looking for support around certification saying, I would love to hire more people, uh, but we have to have money to pay for the certification. Now they can partner up with the state through the Bronx Tech Hire and the Bronx Hire program so that that certification can be paid for. It was us finding all the different barriers and removing those barriers. And so we, we've been able to demonstrate that. You know, we're not just looking at retail jobs, we're looking at jobs beyond that. Uh, for, for me, it's about not uh, someone just making a profit, it's about compensating a community. That's how we think about things. And, and our vision is called 321 of, you know, the three E's of economic development, education, equality for all, the two paths of minority women-owned businesses being, becoming stronger so they can hire more people, a career-oriented education so someone can go from the cradle to the career, the one goal, make the South Bronx the urban metropolis of the world. And so if I create the educational system so that the training happens, if I create the business environment so that businesses want to stay and be there, if I focus on the equality and also the equity so there's greater fairness that's happening, that's how the business community will be present. And then on top of that, focus on what we did this year, mm -hmm. raising minimum wages, raise the different wages that are happening. All these things combined create the business environment for success. You know, it's just, uh, just back up a little, because around the Jewish view, I have to say something from the Talmud that says if you don't, uh, teach your child, your son, a craft, you're teaching him how to rob. Yep. So they say, what do you mean teaching? You teach him how to rob? He says, well, if he doesn't have a job, what else is he going to do? Absolutely. So just, I mean, you're, another corollary of this is just that the, uh, the crime rate's going to go down. You give a person a job in a future, they're not going to go into the, yeah. Look, to the criminal acts. If you create the space for someone to uh, have those economic opportunities, uh, you derail the other thoughts that happen. You know, when, when people have idle energy, that's when bad things happen. Uh, and, it, and it's not that and Nothing these, good happens after 2 a.m. Yeah, you know, look. No, no, it, after 2 a.m., well, nothing just, good happens. Well, not, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it's also in the afternoon. You know, look at a lot of the things that are occurring is because, you know, there's not enough opportunities for after school and it was a training and, and vocational itself. So, you know, I always often, I often say, if, if a young person is standing on the corner and, and they may be doing things that are bad at that moment, it's not that that kid isn't, is a smart kid. They're a smart kid. They just may not have been accessed or directed to the right opportunities. And so our responsibility is how do you connect them? How do you have the career days? How do you have the immediate job fairs? How do you have the trainings that are putting them into the pipeline? How are you not just thinking about apprenticeships but the journeyman uh, pathway? All of those uh, scenarios are creating the environment for success. The young people want to do well. It's our job to give them the, the pipeline to get there. Excellent. All right. So it looks like you're doing an excellent job, though, with the Bronx. That's you know, for we, sure. You know, we're, you know, we're trying. You know, I guess that's the minister in me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Everything uh, that I see when I come down the Major Deegan, I mean, it's building and building. And, you know, it's just this impression I have that all of a sudden, you know, when Ruben Diaz, after he left the assembly, I mean, he had this vision and his, his goal was to and he's seeing his goal, he's, you know, reaching that. It's happening. It's happening. Your passion is housing. Yeah. Because you're chair of the subcommittee on Mitchell Lama. Could you first explain what Mitchell Lama is? I know what it is, but I wanted you to explain it, because there's also Mitchell Lama housing in Syracuse and other and pockets upstate, but really the Bronx is the hub of it. Well, in, in, well not just, I mean, in the Bronx has a sizable portion. Uh, it's throughout the city, throughout the, the, the collective area. What are we doing on on affordable housing, uh, creating programs so that it's actually true middle income housing that's happening. We have it in Concourse Village. Uh, so we're working on legislation right now with, with Chairman Keith Wright on how is it easier for someone to apply for Michelama and also to be aware of if, why they're rejected from Michelama. Uh, it's our responsibility to say if you really want to create a path for middle income housing and you want people to have sustained affordable housing, then we have to make sure people have more opportunities to get into that housing. So what is Mitchell Lama housing and how did it get named Mitchell Lama? Well, you know, it, it, the, the naming came from the combination of the authors of the, the, of the program, their, their respective last names, you know, from years ago. Uh, so this, these are dedicated sets of housing. City uh, owns some portion, state owns some portion through HPD and HCR uh, itself. Uh, of how do we have dedicated units that focus on this middle uh, income opportunity uh, itself. Uh, so th that's how we got there. What we need to be now in engaging in is, you know, where do we go from here to keep people within Michelama, keep them within uh, affordable housing, uh, which otherwise hadn't been happening without so that support. So in this last, last budget negotiation, how did Michelama housing fare? Uh, well, we're in the process right now. There's a $1.8 billion uh, uh, memorandum of un understanding uh, collectively for housing. Uh, so we're still going through those negotiations and those conversations right now. Uh, what do we need to do 
to ensure not just Mitchell Lama, but affordable housing collectively, as released the middle income housing especially, uh, can grow and expand. But not just for middle income housing. Uh, NYCHA is a big priority of ours. You know, we're the second largest population of NYCHA of anyone New in York New York City. City. Housing Authority. New York City Housing yeah. Authority uh, itself. Uh, what are we doing to create more incentives for developers that are coming into our communities to allow them the, the opportunity to ensure that they are building developments that are keeping our residents there? Uh, a, a lot of the, the next steps over the next, you know, uh, say six weeks are going to be focused on housing and in a large part. What are we going to do around this $1.8 billion to make sure that our communities get the support that they need? Let me ask you because, you know, I know from more Brooklyn because uh, Chabad is centered in Crown Heights and uh, my kids live in Brooklyn also. And if you say a house for a, a million dollars, people laugh at you. They yeah. says, you can't even get anything for a million dollars. Yeah. Even, you know, in bedford Stuy and Brownsville. So what's the pricing market, which I don't know in... In Bronx, I mean, it's like you were just talking about affordable housing, yeah. a million dollars, who can afford Yeah, well, Riverdale is much different than the South Bronx. Yeah, also. I mean, very much so. I mean, our, our average median income is only about $25,000. So it, it's, uh, and you have a lot of regulated units. I mean, the, the, there's great variance depending on where you're at uh, itself. I mean, a lot of it is apartments and, and rentals. Uh, which is why we're, we're really trying to change the rules around you know, the, the vacancy bonus, which is to me a, an absolutely terrible policy where uh, a, a landlord and owner is able to essentially create incentives to kick you out, which is pretty much what they're doing in, in that manner. Uh, so the, 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 there's variance in terms of the expenses. Our, our biggest priority has to be though, what are we doing so that we're creating an environment so that residents have the protections that they need that they don't have right now? Okay. I I just want people to know that you're also a member of several other committees, including the Banks Committee, mm -hmm. the Correction Committee, Election Law, Government Operations, Housing, which makes sense, and Veterans Affairs. Mm -hmm. Were you a veteran? No, my, veteran? Uh, my oldest brother uh, has just gone into his 29th year of service, okay. starting first class. So uh, it's a very personal uh, priority for me. Two of my, my staffers are also vets. How old are you? 33. 33, and your brother is? Uh, well, he's 50, <laughs> okay. 54. I was saying, if he's 20. Yeah, there's okay. a gap, yeah. Okay. Um, and you're a member of the Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Sec second vice chair, so we've been able second to do a lot, vice of, chair, so a lot of good work. Then in what, two years you're going to be president of that? Oh, wait, we're, we're just focused on uh, being vice chair no, right no, now. No, is no, there, is there a pecking order? No, it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, each election. Uh, uh, happens separately. It's okay. not a. It's not it's, a succession plan. Oh, that's right. Okay. How many that's years have you been there now? Uh, so this is my second uh, year. year, my first term. So uh, we just were elected last year. Right. right and uh, is it the dream now? Uh, is this what you thought it was going to be? I came in with very little expectation because it's very different to go from being a staffer to the principal. Uh, but I am incredibly happy. Uh, I, I, we have done very good work. Uh, you know, we, we were focused on what are we going to do around housing. You know, we were able to get about 16, uh, 2.2 million rather, uh, for NYCHA development support, you know, New York City Housing Authority, and also in this Mitchell Lama bill, uh, economic development, we were able to work on MWB's efforts, uh, education, $16 million for our schools and our districts. Uh, we've done good work. So I'm M excited. MWB, Minority and Women Owned Business, business Enterprises. Enterprises. Right. Um, it's a it's an alphabet soup at the capital. You know, you know, that, that's that's pretty much sure. what it is all the time. And I know at the okay, but on the so the banks committee is because you you gravitated towards that. Or well, that financial good? literacy has always been important to me. I was financial a senior advisor. I was a senior okay. advisor for Operation Hope, uh, which which is probably the leading nonprofit in the country around uh, making people more uh, understanding of their finances in that manner. So we, we have a project called Project 5117 that we're doing uh, thanks to Operation Hope, which is focused on how to get five million young people to have financial literacy around the country, a million of those five million to become entrepreneurs themselves, the second one being a thousand Hope Insight centers created within financial institutions so that people can start their businesses easier, and then the seven is a 700 credit score. Uh, so we're going to be launching that out uh, uh, in later this spring. Uh, thanks to the work of Eric Ordner and, and their nonprofit and other support we'll be having, uh, uh, Eric Kohler rather, and their nonprofit uh, to be able to amplify it in that manner. Okay, you're on the correction committee. Oh, yeah. You have prisons in your district? Or uh, you we don't just have, them have in, uh, mem uh, constituents who are in prison. Well, uh, I think <laughs> unfortunately all of us have some representation, but you know. It, no, it, you're, you know, no, you're right. I mean, you know, I, I know yeah. people. I went to, I visited friends in state prison. And, and county jail, and yeah. you know, but I'm just asking. I mean, you I mean, Khalif Browder, uh, who was the, the focus of the, the Raise the Age campaign, was yeah. our constituent. Oh, what do you think of that? 
Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's inhumane that where New York is one of two states in the country where 16 and 17 year olds are still tried as adults. Uh, and so uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it goes against our morality, honestly. So uh, I, in large reason it hasn't happened because Senate Republicans uh, feel that uh, they'll be allowing criminals to be running the streets, which is just simply not true. Uh, so that is a priority of us. So the 16 and 17 year olds, I think the governor is going to put them in Hudson Correctional Facility. Yeah, but that, that's and not segregate that's, them. Yeah, that's not raising the age though. That's just no. that's just that's just moving. That's a people. stopgap yeah. measure, but it's somewhat palatable because at least they're not with adult criminals and they're not learning how to have a uh, how to uh, be come back to prison after they're released. Well, we're, again, but, but them, well, we're presuming that they were criminals in the first place. Khalif Browder that's, was, well, that's was true. Khalif Browder was locked up for allegedly stealing a book bag, right? So uh, the, the, we, we can't presume that these folks are criminals just because they're there. You know what? Uh, there are so many people, I hear corrections guards and other law enforcement officials saying, yeah, the jails are full of innocent people. They're all saying they're innocent and they were mocking them. But now with DNA, you see, yeah. maybe they were right, you know? Yeah. Maybe these people are saying, I, I was railroaded and know, I shouldn't be here. When, when I think about mm -hmm. my uh, reflections, you know, I've, I've, been, you know, I've been preaching for 21 years, uh, and I've been fortunate to been to Israel twice. The, the, uh, a lot of what goes to my mind is the morality of our decisions, right? And, and I truly do feel that, it, it gets, again, it's inhumane and immoral that we uh, allow this law to stay on the books. Uh, in this manner. I, I think as it relates to criminal justice, uh, you know, raise the age, you know, grand jury transparency, the special prosecutor that, you know, how do we make that statutory so that if, if an unarmed, unarmed individual loses their life uh, due to an officer, you have a special prosecutor jump in. In the exact same way, I think if someone attack or kills a correctional officer, they should be prosecuted as well. Uh, you know, we have to really, you know, ask ourselves how are we serving the least of these, right? That's, that's what we're taught to. Uh, and, and I think many times our, 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 our policies aren't doing that, and that's one of the reasons why I enjoy what I do. Wow. So you know, just on the business point, just go back for a second. Yeah. Again, I have to bring in a Talmudic statement because yeah. I'm the rabbi. Yeah, yeah. And it just says that, you know, there's different levels of charity and helping people. But the best one of all that Maimonides says is giving someone a job. Yeah. You know, yeah. because if they have a job, then they, you know, you don't have to feel like I'm a... You know, I'm a loser, I have to take charity and wealth from someone. Hey, I have a business, yeah. I'm doing something. Well, you don't just want to give them a job, you want to give them the training. Yeah, right? sure. you know, and, 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 and you want to give them the opportunity, but make sure you give them the opportunity to succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and with that, that's how you transform a community. Uh, you're also on the election law committee. I am. Now, you have two bills, 6030 and 5922, which both say relates to voting rights. They both have the same short title. What, what are the, I mean, I don't know if you... If so, you, are, are you, are well, we, you have, we have several that are, have similar impact. Uh, some are focused on, on increasing opportunities related to absentee voting. Others are on, on creating more days for individuals to vote uh, itself. Uh, you know, we, we've pretty much had a, a stone wall that has come from the Republican side, to be very honest and transparent on that. Uh, uh, you know, my uh, focus, I'm on the, the board for iVote, which is focused on how to have greater voting protection and rights for individuals. So, you know, that, that's a, a lot of the focus on those two pieces of bills. Uh, we have other legislation that's focused on voting rights as well. But I, I, my uh, broader concern when we're looking at what's happening right now, uh, you, you don't really hear a coherent argument on the other side of why would we, uh, um, why would we make it more difficult for someone to vote? It just doesn't make any sense well, to Well, I remember me. before your time, Mario Cuomo uh, in the 80s would say, why do, we only have to, why do we have to have only one day for voting? Why does it have to be at a polling place? If it snows in Messina, you know, and you can't get out to the poll, why can't we have a roving mobile unit that would, you know, come to your block and you would, like the ice cream man would come to well, your block. Well, we know block, why, right? I mean, right? And I mean, then people they, would come they, they out and they would vote. vote. You yeah, know. but I mean that's the reason so, why they don't want more people to vote. I mean, it's when the, you say they, you mean the incumbents in general? No, I, I no, I think in, in large part the the, the 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 Senate Republicans have not demonstrated any desire or ability uh, or rationale uh, of why the opposition. You know, it's it's, it's it but doesn't. But do they have to. Is there a need for them to provide some some rationalization for their opposition? Well, I think if you're an elected official, there should be a rationale as to why you're denying uh, moving forward on something that is good for people. It is really hard to convey uh, to the everyday person 
that it is best for them to have limited amount of time opportunities to vote. Right? I, 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 don't, I don't think you will find any person that will hear, well, you actually have it incredibly difficult scenario to vote. We would like to make it easier for you to vote. And someone is just saying no. I um, mean, yes, there is a responsibility, in my opinion, uh, to be conveying the rationale on okay. why you would be conveying it. Why do you have the short title being the same on two bills? Well, it's not why do I have that. I mean, I well, think in lar a large well, reason, it's, it's just how the, uh, the information is, is okay. shared on, on the website pick, itself. You know, no, 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 you don't. Oh, no. that's done from a, okay. Correct. So then you're also on government operations committee. Okay. I am. So how do you feel the government is operating? Is it operating well as a greased wheel? Or? Uh, it is operating well. There, there's, al there's always more efficiencies one can have. You know, GovOps, I'm on that committee predominantly because of the work we've been talking through, uh, again, minority and women-owned businesses and, and what are we doing to improve contracting so that more okay. uh, jobs can be created itself. Uh, any entity can always run better. You know, I think we all can <laughs> agree with that. Uh, itself. Uh, I think the, the responsibility is, is how do we find more ways to uh, ensure uh, that government is running even better. Do you have a uh, second job? Do you have outside income? I do. Uh, you know, separate from uh, uh, the, the, the legislature, I do consulting, uh, predominantly focused on helping large uh, organizations that are focused on minority women-owned businesses uh, and or uh, working on helping individuals that are amplifying their national conferences. And that was with, uh, that's with Atlas? Uh, with Atlas and individually, yes. And what about Hilltop? Uh, not doing that any longer, no. I don't see anything in your background about Hilltop, but I saw that there was an article about mm -hmm. Hilltop. Did you just did it never start to begin with when the article came out? Or? Well, again, I, I think you have you know, hit pieces that happen in politics, right? I, I was um, doing work with, with Hilltop. Uh, I was going to join them as a partner. I, I fully disclosed that work. I actually disclosed it ahead of time earlier than I needed to. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it was on the same day that Dean Skelos was convicted, right? <laughs> yeah. So timing is uh, everything. Timing is everything. And I think a large reason that that was what, but you know, they're a great company to do great work. Uh, I, I think it was a, a, a blip on the screen in the grand, in, in the grand scheme. I do too. I just needed to ask about that. So uh, do you feel that, this, that the legislature is going to get out of this uh, notion that they're, you know, while it's a very small percentage that have been tossed into jail, you know, but that there's more honesty in the legislature now? Do you feel that there's, you know, do you think there needs to be more ethics reform? Can you legislate ethics? I think media um, has not done a fair job of trying to convey the scenario. And when you communicate that there's a culture of corruption, right. um, to me that's completely inappropriate. Um, have individuals made bad, terrible mistakes? Yes. Well, you should. succeeded one of them. Uh, yes. And, yeah, and, so, and, and so there, there should be penalties when folks do right. these things. You know, right. if you break the law, absolutely. Uh, it, it is completely inappropriate for it to be conveyed that all politicians have something that they're doing wrong and or for it to even be implied as such. Uh, uh, can you legislate ethics? No, I don't believe you can ever legislate ethics. I, I think you can uh, ensure that there are better rules put in place uh, so that there's more fairness uh, that's happening, uh, more transparency, which is what we worked on. We had a government uh, work group uh, created on transparency to make the process smoother, i.e. Uh, have committee hearings that can be broadcast so people can be aware of that. You know, that's how those changes can happen to make it a, a much uh, fairer process for the general public. Okay, and uh, do you feel like, you, oh, you also, you seem to be a prestigious fundraiser. Do you have a lot of, do you do fundraising like, you know, regularly or are you doing better than most? I mean, you seem... I, I, I think all of us have to raise funds to be able to be competitive <laughs> uh, in elections. It's evil, you know. Even... I won't call it an evil. Again, I think, <laughs> I think again, we got to be mindful of the words so that we people use. Who hate, people who hate fundraising and hate picking up the well, calls just, to ask people for well, money, you mean, call it an evil. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're doing it to just, uh, uh, you're trying to communicate a message, you know. And I right. think a lot of times you can have a good message and you may not be able to get that out there. So... Uh, we, we, we've been fortunate about the, the support we've been able to gain now from you've, people. You know, I come from a family where if I got a 98 on a test, and my father would say, well, how, what happened to the other 2%? You won your election with, what, 93% of the vote? Uh, we, 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 we did well. You uh, did well, we 93%. Did well. What happened to the other 7%? No, <laughs> it's I, a joke. I, I guess they didn't, okay. they, didn't, they didn't know me as well. <laughs> but, you know, you know, I mean, you're in a safe district. 
I mean, uh, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, if whoever wins, if there is a primary, whoever wins the primary wins the general, yeah. like the whole city of Albany. It's uh, yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, so why do all the fundraising? If you're safe and you well, you, have well, you again, is it to keep away opponents that they see that you have such a big bank account that they say no? It's it's about communicating your message to voters, and and uh, you know we we did a lot of that in a contested primary before, um, and you, you're always preparing. I mean, you're you're running every two years, so you know it, it's better to be a planner than not. You know the the rule is uh, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So, you know, being prepared allows you to be ready. Wow, you got that down, that's good. No, yeah. that's very insightful, it really is, and that's why I ask you these questions, because I get a better answer from you than I do from most. So, oh, well. I, you know, th don't take it the wrong way. No, I, I just, appreciate you know, that. Uh, I wanted to. Right. You know, Mike, there you're doing great work, you have done, and you're a young person, Thank so you know. actually we're gonna be looking forward to some bigger and better things from you, because we expect a lot of things. I think you're articulate, you're intelligent, and you've okay. accomplished a lot in your short That's why I got years. him on the show. There you go. Because he's articulate, he's intelligent, he's good, you know? Yeah. Just, trying, just trying to do a good thing. And you're All doing right. it, and that's good. Continued success. Thank really. you. Very Thank good. You. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Mark.